I will take over. Got it. And uh, many of you know me because I'm in charge of workshops. And welcome tonight. Nice to see you. And I am so looking forward to tonight's program. We've been talking about this for many months, and it's terrific that it's finally here. As you know from what you've read, there's Mike Trigg on the left and Mehran Sahami on the right. And I'll start with Mehran. He is a professor of engineering at, at that little university down the street from us who are in Silicon Valley. He is an associate chair for education and computer science. He is also a fellow at uh, the undergraduate education part of the university. And he is the author of System Error, Why Big Tech Went Wrong. And this is the good part, how we can reboot. <laughs> we always need that, that ending part to balance. Mike Trigg on the left, he has over 20 years of experience here in Silicon Valley. And in fact, he was a wonderful speaker here at a Silicon Valley Product Management Association for five years ago, whatever it was. It, he just, he rocked it. He just brought his real experiences. You don't want to have to go through the same thing, but the audience loved it. He has been a founder and an executive and certainly an employee at dozens of venture-backed startups, and he's an angel investor himself. He is the author of BitFlip, which is a novel that I've read, and I may read it again. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to both of these guys and let you, let them give you kind of a a helicopter view or a different perspective of our wonderful, crazy Silicon Valley. All yours. Great. Thanks, Mela. Uh, Mayron, I think you're going to start us off, correct? Yeah. Thanks very much for, for having us here. Really appreciate it. And so what I want to do is uh, share a screen uh, with you and, and take you just kind of through a little brief overview of the book and then turn it over to Mike to talk about his book and kind of how some of the themes fit together. Um, this book, System Era, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot, actually came out of some work I did with some colleagues where we were teaching a class together around some of the issues that have come up as a result of, of the technology sector. And the co-authors are Rob Reich, who's actually a moral philosopher, and Jerry Weinstein, who's a public policy expert and worked in the Obama administration. And I'm the technical guy. And we sort of brought our expertise together. And after four or five years of teaching a class together, we wrote this book. And the high level view is that technology generates externality. So in the same way that you might think, for example, the fossil fuel industry produces certain kind of externalities that society has to grapple with, technology companies do the same thing. We just haven't thought about it in those terms for a long time. And to help frame that problem, one of the things we think about, we kind of think about systematic drivers that lead to some of these externalities. Um, one of them is what we refer to as the optimization mindset of technologists. And being a technologist myself, this very much resonates, is the notion that oftentimes what we're trying to do is there's some problem we're trying to optimize. There are some metrics we care about. We might call them objectives and key results. We might call them key performance indicators, whatever the case may be. There are some things we are measuring that we're trying to make better over time. And the issue there, the problem is not just having OKRs or KPIs in themselves, but is thinking about how those things are defined. Because oftentimes, if we think about the objective that we're trying to maximize, is if the objective itself is a bad objective, optimization is just making the situation worse. But most of the time, we don't have a bad goal or objective in mind. The problem is we have some goal in mind, but we don't have a good way of actually measuring things like, say, in Facebook's case, how we create a more connected society. So what do we do? We come up with proxies for these measures. We come up with things like the amount of time people spend on the platform, how many things they click on, how many friends they have. Those measures become proxies of the things that we're trying to measure that we really want to measure. And part of the problem is those proxies are actually insufficient to really measure what's going on. And when we try to optimize those things, there's other values we lose because there's multiple goals or values we should actually care about. Let me give you a simple example. In the case of YouTube, one of the kinds of things they try to optimize is the number of minutes of video that are watched. That's great if you're Google and what you care about is more minutes of video being displayed so you can show more ads. 
it's not so great for my teenage children that are spending lots of time glued to a screen because they're being pushed more and more sticky videos for them to watch because the, in some sense, their mental health and well-being are not part of the objective function that's being optimized. They are essentially an externality of the system. And how we got here is the fact that, in fact, there's regulatory indifference to these things. If you remember back to sort of the mid-1990s, we got the Communications Decency Act, which at the time may have been the legislation we needed, but it created a regulatory oasis around the tech sector. It basically freed companies, platforms of legal liability for the information that was on there as long as they sort of made a good faith effort to, for, for dealing with some of the problems. The issue is we live in a different sort of regulatory regime now. We've seen now on display all kinds of issues with algorithms, for example, being used to make life critical decisions like who gets access to healthcare, who gets bail in the criminal justice system, who gets a mortgage. Um, and there's when these things are measured, they show actual lots of bias in these systems around issues of gender and race that these systems have learned from real world data and are continuing under the guise of being objective because they're you know, computational systems continuing to make biased decisions. In the realm of data gathering, we see notions of data maximization. This is something you might deal with in your own organization. The notion of let's measure or gather as much data as we can because we don't know what'll be useful down the line. Well, there's a value trade-off here. All of these issues in technology have value trade-offs, and the value trade-off between data maximization is the notion of privacy. How do we think about individual privacy? What rights does an individual have to their own data? And we're beginning to see a regulatory landscape actually driven mostly by Europe now, but also coming up in the United States that's taking action around these fronts. That creates liability for companies that we need to be aware of and think of. Then we move into the realm of thinking about artificial intelligence, automation, and human well-being, depending on who you talk to by 2030. So we're talking less than 10 years from now, somewhere between 9% and 43% of jobs will be impacted significantly by automation. How do we plan for that? If we see that's actually coming down the road in the next 10 years, we need to think about what are ways we can put policies into place that actually address these issues. How do we think about reskilling? How do we think about educational programs when at the same time what we see our government doing is moving in an opposite direction of potentially cutting educational budgets? And then probably the big one that we've all grappled with at some point is the notion of free speech and democracy in online platforms. What does it mean for our polarization? What does it mean for human dignity? And the way we think about this to throw out kind of a fancy academic term, because I'm an academic, even though I spent a bunch of years in industry before I came back to academia, we view this problem as what we refer to as a trilemma of values, because there's three different values in tension here. One is free speech, which the United States has a very strong commitment to through the First Amendment. Another one is human dignity, who can be harassed online and how can they be harassed and how is that still protected by free speech rights? And the third one is democracy. As we allow for more misinformation and disinformation on these platforms, we erode the foundation of factual information that people use to make decisions in a democracy. How do we trade these values off? Because that's what we need to really understand is the values that are at stake in order to make these decisions. So to wrap up a little bit, you know, one of the things we think about in the book is we take a hopeful tone, right? It's not just all gloom and doom. It doesn't have to be this way. Technology is not just a wave that washes over us. It's something that we have immense power over. And as a matter of fact, most of the people on this call right now have much more power than most people in the world to impact the future course of technology. And so what are some of the solutions? You know, what the tech sector often likes to do is they say, well, here are the things you can do as an individual. You can set the privacy settings in your apps, or you can choose which apps you want to use. If you don't like Facebook, just don't use it. You can set privacy settings in your browser, or incognito mode, all these kinds of things that you can do as an individual. And the problem with that framing is that individual action, as I'm sorry to say, is insufficient, right? If I choose not to be on Facebook, I am not immune from the impact of Facebook on our democracy. So it is insufficient to say this is a matter of personal choice. It's actually a systematic problem. And so we need systemic solutions to address it. And the way to think about these systemic solutions is we draw an analogy in the book, which we think about the roadway system. Back at the turn of the century, when cars and the back of the turn of the 20th century, not the 21st century, when cars were being mass produced, 
you could tell people, well, if you don't like cars and the dangers they provide, just don't drive. That's your personal decision. And you would understand what an impoverished choice that was if your only choice was to use the technology or not use the technology, because the technology has intrinsic value for many people. So giving it up is actually a very difficult choice to make. What did we do instead? We said, we're going to actually put some regulations in. We're going to tell people which side of the road they should drive on. We're going to put in speed bumps around schools. We're going to put in speed limits. We're going to put in traffic signs, a whole bunch of things that are systemic solutions that made driving safer for everyone. Now, you still have a choice whether you want to drive or not, but you do it in a framework that actually helps regulate some of those externalities from impacting society more broadly. That's the place we need to get to with technology. So how do we do that? Just very briefly, one is to think about cultivating a sense of ethical responsibility in computer science. Many other fields actually have this. For example, in the medical profession, if you engage in malpractice, you can have your license revoked. Same thing in the legal profession. For example, in bioengineering with CRISPR technology, there is actually very early on, scientists came together to actually say, we are not going to use this technology to edit the human germline. That was a decision they made as part of their culture. We don't have anything like that in technology right now. The next is to think about checking the power of large technology companies. What are ways where we could think about what are the societal values we care about, how to make these companies care more about those values? Part of it comes internally from fine folks like you who think about how product direction gets set. But in some cases, what's also necessary is regulation to have compliance with certain kinds of things like algorithmic transparency so we can guarantee some notion of what's going on in due process. And lastly, we need to build a democracy that's actually capable of governing technology. Now, I know what most people are thinking. They're like, our government is dysfunctional. It can't solve these problems. How can we potentially think that regulation is actually going to get there? Well, the truth is we have the government that we ask for. Right? It's not like the government is this other entity that exists. We created it. We voted into power. There used to be an office called the Office of Technology Assessment, if anyone remembers this back in the 70s, 80s, all the way through the mid 90s, whose job was as a nonpartisan organization to provide expertise for government decision making around technology. What did we do? We disbanded it in the mid 90s, thanks to the contract for America. Okay, so these are choices we made. There's no reason why we can't make choices to go back to a democracy that's actually capable of regulating and we're beginning to actually see some steps being taken in that direction. So that's really the way to think about it. We do have power as individuals, but that's not enough. We need to think about our technology sector coming together to think about what do we wanna accomplish within the industry and then ways that regulation can actually play a role to help us create more societal safeguards more broadly. And with that said, I think Mike's book does a great example, has a great example of actually having a story where someone has to grapple with these values and think about what they mean to them. And so I'll turn it over to Mike for more there. Great, thanks, Maron. Uh, I, I Maron's book uh, is a must read for anybody working in Silicon Valley and in the tech industry. Um, I just think the multidisciplinary approach that you took with your fellow authors uh, is just so refreshing and it was so uh, such a unique vantage point. Um, so I wrote a story about all this stuff uh, called Bitflip. Um, it's a novel. You can still learn things from fiction, believe it or not. Uh, I wasn't a heavy uh, fiction reader prior to writing this book. Now I read a, a novel every week. Um, but I was really kind of inspired to do it. I, as Mela mentioned in, in the introduction, you know, I've been in Silicon Valley a long time. Mayron and I actually worked together is how we know each other 20 years ago at Epiphany, one of the companies that we were both at. He was in engineering. I was a VP of product management. Um, and you know, I've had in many ways a fairly typical Silicon Valley career. I've gone, I've worked in big companies, I've worked in small companies, kind of everything along the way. And um, I increasingly felt like I wanted to, um, you know, tell that story. Um, where I got frustrated, I guess, was that, you know, for all the coverage of Silicon Valley in the media and many great nonfiction books, I just didn't see that many um, fiction titles um, out there that I thought kind of credibly and, and authentically represented the industry 
and would resonate with people who've been in that industry. Um, and in fact, even, even worse, and this is, I think, one of the great virtues of um, system error, is there's a tendency to either glorify or vilify uh, people in tech. And many people in tech have sort of gone through both cycles. You know, Mark Zuckerberg was glorified and now he's vilified. Elon Musk was glorified and then vilified. And, you know, from my perspective, that really didn't tell the story. Um, I felt like the story of Silicon Valley, uh, as Mehran touched on, is really one of a system uh, that is sort of set up and creates certain incentives for the actors in that system, whether they're investors, operators, um, you know, bankers, everybody who propels technologists, everybody who kind of propels this industry. Um, and so what I set out to write in BitFlip was, to some extent, a cautionary tale. Um, I described the novel as a critique of Silicon Valley tech culture disguised as a corporate thriller. Uh, it needed to have a plot and not just be preachy. Um, but uh, the title BitFlip um, stands, you know, is a, is a reference to a technical term of a bit, a zero or one in binary code, switching between one or the other. And the title was something I sort of came up for the book, uh, even before I think I wrote very many pages of it, uh, because it represented something I was going through myself, uh, kind of a change of heart uh, about the industry, about my role in the industry. And, I, and I've really seen, you know, I started writing the book prior to COVID. Um, I think COVID has really, really exacerbated some of those sentiments. Uh, and I've described it on my blog. I did a post about um, Silicon Valley's identity crisis. You know, when I came to Silicon Valley in the late 90s, it was nirvana. I mean, it was there were no externalities, as Mehran describes, right? There, this was an industry that was all upside and no consequences. Um, we were making the world a better place and making money while doing it. That was sort of the inherent value proposition, unlike those Wall Street guys or, or you know, oil or pharma or other industries that have known externalities at the time, we felt like we were just doing good. And I really think that sentiment began to change in the, you know, 2010 to 2015 range. Um, you know, there was an increasing awareness of the detrimental effects of social media, especially on children. Um, there, the uh, manipulation of some of the social media platforms uh, as we got into the elections, obviously with Cambridge Analytica stuff and, and all that sort of, uh, those sorts of issues. I think further brought this to the, the forefront. And, you know, meanwhile, for those of us living in the Bay Area, we've witnessed the consequences of this firsthand, right? There's um, widespread gentrification, huge wealth stratification, um, you know, the affordability of the Bay Area has been extremely challenging. Uh, and many, many people have left the Bay Area. Um, and in some draft demographics in huge numbers, um, the San Francisco Chronicle did a survey that showed people, I think it was 25 to 35 have left San Francisco, 25% of them have left San Francisco over the pandemic. Uh, and some of those are temporary things. Some of those are, um, you know, the ability to work remotely obviously impacted the industry quite dramatically. But, um, you know, some of that is just people losing faith in the industry and uncertain about what their role in, in that industry is. And I, I welcome the opportunity to talk to a group of product managers because product managers are really at the forefront of this, right? They are the ones, you know, keeping the trains running on time. They're the ones making decisions uh, about how the product should work, how, how features and functionality should work. They're the ones doing A-B testing. They're the ones setting KPIs and setting OKRs often. Um, and that, with that comes a great deal of responsibility. I think I reflected on my career as I wrote the book. I, I, as I mentioned, um, you know, I've mostly been in product management, product marketing kind of roles. Um, you know, I recognize my own culpability in this. I, uh, there were certainly moments I worked for a huge social networking company 
uh, at the time, mostly international. And it is very easy to become myopically focused on a metric and sort of lose track of the bigger picture of why am I doing this? What potential impact does this have on users when you're at the scale of millions and millions of people? Um, I too, you know, I really share, and Mehran and I have done a number of joint um, book events, which have been super fun because uh, he uh, comes at it from the, um, you know, nonfiction and academic side, and I kind of come at it from the storytelling side. But I'd, I'd say our thesis is very similar in terms of where we see challenges in the industry. Um, you know, I've written about this quite extensively on my blog, uh, MikeTrig.com. I keep a pretty active blog. I actually started my career way back in the early 90s. I was in Washington, D.C. when the contract with America happened, um, working on Capitol Hill. Um, and, you know, I, even though anytime you work in D.C., it can create, you know, make you a little bit skeptical about the regulatory process and, and the, the federal government's ability to um, influence commerce, you know, we need it. We need it. Uh, and I think you see more and more leaders in tech companies asking for it, in fact, because the landscape is so competitive that if you are the company who, you know, abides by your morals, you might be left behind by the next, next new thing. Um, and so I do think that there's a, a, an important role for uh, regulatory and governmental oversight. I juxtapose the tech, tech industry with my wife's industry. She's in medical devices. And even though the FDA is sort of a four-letter <laughs> four term in their space at times, it can be very frustrating, but it really provides a very, very useful service in terms of clinical trials, regulatory approvals, and that sort of thing. I think if you look at, you know, to take one case, the, the recent Facebook data that where they had, you know, internal testing uh, showing the detrimental effects of the Instagram platforms on mental health of teenagers, particularly young women, you know, that kind of stuff could and probably should be filed um, with some governmental entity. Um, I agree too, uh, the Communication Decency Act is long due, written in 1996, long due for uh, reform so that there is more accountability in these platforms. They have outsized impact on our lives um, and, you know, we're, we're frankly overdue for, for further regulation on them. So now that is not really what the book is, my book is about. My book at its core is about an individual uh, Sam Hughes is the protagonist, who's a C-level executive at a startup company and has a moment of truth saying early in the book. He's thrust on stage uh, unexpectedly. The story that somebody shared was great uh, leading in about uh, worst, worst uh, nightmares where you're told you need to present with no uh, prior notice. Well, that happens to Sam and he, uh, in a moment of candor, ends up getting fired from his company. And that casts him sort of out of his organization, makes him really reassess, uh, causes him to sort of spin into a midlife crisis, if you will, um, as he reflects on these things and what his role is and, and, and um, you know, what his ambitions are. Um, and then an unexpected thing happens. He discovers inadvertently that there might be fraud going on within the company by the younger founder and the venture investors in the, in the, in the startup. Um, so Sam starts to pull on that thread uh, a little bit of it is his fiduciary responsibility. A little of it is his uh, desire to seek revenge. Um, but he re-entangles in the company and really starts to go down um, this slippery slope that we're talking about, where his decisions get clouded by um, his ambitions. And he sort of loses touch with his moral compass um, and uh, again, it's sort of meant to be a cautionary tale of, you know, what happens if you end up going down that path uh, and what are the trade-offs? How, how, how much are you willing to give up uh, for entrepreneurial success? Um, and that's something, you know, I've certainly felt uh, there's tremendous pressure on all of us. Many of you probably want to or already have started companies. Um, it's an ambition of, you know, many, many people in the Valley. Um, but hopefully this book will, you know, give you some thoughts to reflect on and how to do that in the most constructive and ethical way. So, uh, so that's the book. It just came out August 16th. It's gotten amazing 
uh, amazing fanfare. It was covered in the San Francisco Chronicle. It was covered right here in our local paper, the Palo Alto Weekly and the Almanac. Uh, it's gotten, you know, five-star reviews from uh, a bunch of uh, reviewers forward and Manhattan Book Review and several others. So uh, I encourage you to check it out. There's an audiobook version available too for those of you who might have to uh, commute. I listen to a lot of my reading on audiobooks as well. So, um, so with that, uh, I think I'll wrap my portion of prepared comments. And then, uh, Mehran, I, I think we we're going to do a little bit of discussion and, and or open it up to Q&A. Well, maybe to start off the discussion by asking a question about, you know, the thing about some of the, the motivations, the experiences that you've had in Silicon Valley. Um, and there's lots of things in there. I mean, I think the, the book, when I read Mike's book, I think it's fantastic. I think if you haven't picked up a copy, it is a great way of getting a combination of a thriller or something that's actually makes a lot of sense for it's got a nice prose narrative to it. And at the same time, has an element of a, of a morality play to it because there's all these things you go through. Um, when you think about, you know, some of the issues that Silicon Valley is grappling with um, and, and, you know, the ways you sort of see them through the protagonist, what made you want to focus on those particular issues? Like, what were the things that were they personal experiences? Were there yeah. other experiences you had in the Valley that really brought those out? Yeah, I mean, the 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 one word summary of what this book is about is ambition, right? Um, there is, you know, this Silicon Valley is largely comprised of transplants. You know, I'm not from here. I grew up in the Midwest um, and transplants from all over the world. People have self-selected to be in Silicon Valley to pursue, you know, their, their dreams of starting a company or joining a startup you know, making a fortune, whatever it might be. Um, and, um, you know, that is great, but like anything, it needs to be done in a sustainable way. And, and in fact, I've recently uh, heard somebody use that exact term, sustainable ambition. And I, and I thought that's, that's a perfect encapsulation of what, I, what the moral of the story is. is. Um, you know, and I think that was, as I wrote the book and I was going through my kind of career pivot from a tech executive to an author, um, you know, it, I, I really reflected quite a bit on that. I realized that, and there's a passage early in the book that, that uh, Sam kind of goes on this rant on stage on this exact subject, that I was sort of measuring myself based on outcomes and exits, right? Like if I didn't have you know an, a, 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 a unicorn valuation, it's like I'm, I'm a failure, right? And that's a pretty pernicious headspace to be in. Um, you know, the facts on the ground are the vast, vast, vast majority, 99% plus of companies that are founded will fail. Um, and yet the stories that we hear about are the ones that were the one in a million moonshots. And that sort of, becomes normalized, right? That becomes our expectation um, and, um, and our ambition. And so, you know, that's what Sam, the protagonist really gets entangled in is he, he sort of thinks his career is over in, for all intents and purposes. And, you know, has this lifeline sort of thrown to him where he can realize these ambitions. He can make his parents proud. He can provide for his family. He can be the entrepreneurial success he's always wanted to be. And, you know, I think for many people in the Valley, that's sort of the root of what motivates them. And, you know, I'd encourage you, if you feel that way, to sort of take a step back and consider, you know, is this, uh, you know, what, what is really important to me? And, I, and the great thing is I see people doing that. I think nothing like a global pandemic to sort of force a little self-reflection, right? That makes a lot of sense. You know, and it, it makes sense both on a personal level in terms of what people are grappling with. And then you kind of think about it on a larger level, especially with, you know, so many folks involved in product management here who are helping set direction for products um, and, and for their companies. Um, you know, one of the things that, that Sam talks about in the book is the motto of Google, don't be evil. Um, and that, you know, he says that in the industry, basically all we're doing is just changing the goalposts of what constitutes evil yeah. to, to, you know, in some sense, justify what we're doing. Do you think that's true of big tech companies? Like, how do you how do you see that that statement from Sam? 
Uh, I think it can be. I think it, you know, I, I witnessed that firsthand. It's very easy. You know, the only thing that matters when you're in the trenches is, you know, getting that outcome, getting that exit. And, um, you know, if you're a mid-level product manager at a, you know, at a, at a big tech company, which I've been, you know, you, your, your entire incentive structure is built around those things sometimes. And you can really very much lose, lose track of why am I doing this? This is, this, you know, as you described it, the externalities aren't on your radar oftentimes, right? You're really just focused on, you know, your, your own career advancement, um, the, the metric that is important to the business, it's going to grow revenue, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I mean, that is one of uh, Sam's, you know, kind of rants in the book, which is kind of me talking where he says, you know, he lists out all these things. He's like, you know, I'd say those things are evil, but we present them as best practices is kind of one of his lines. And, and um, you know, I think it's always important to take that step back and just know why you're, why, why that metric matters know why it, you know, why it impacts the business. And, and especially for consumer apps that are at scale, you know, understanding what the, what those externalities are. Um, and you see this, I mean, one of the wonderful things about the tech industry is, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty good at disrupting ourselves, right? I mean, I think that the industry is again, populated with people who are progressive and want to do the right thing and have wring their hands over some of these externalities, right? I mean, I have friends at Facebook and other companies that, you know, worry about this stuff. And, and we've seen, um, you know, employee kind of uh, uprisings might be too strong a word, but, you know, employees sort of um, raise those issues with senior management at, at, you know, Google and Amazon and other kinds of companies because they, they, they want to do the right thing. They, ha they do have a, 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 a good moral compass. And so I think we've seen already uh, companies themselves take actions in these areas to try and um, you know, mitigate the negative effects of the tech industry. I was gonna. I have one more question. Then you know, I figured you know we could perfect. Open yeah, yeah, up yeah. Other yeah. things. Um, you know, one of the things you were talking about is is kind of the actions that that people take, and we oftentimes you know put a positive spin on what we do, right? And I say that as someone who spent a decade in the tech industry, most of it at Google before going back to academia. Um, and sometimes the truth gets stretched. Sometimes, you know, as, as uh, I won't give away too much in the book, but, you know, <laughs> it crosses over into outright fraud, which is one of the things you'll, you'll appreciate when you read the book in terms of the, the thriller aspect of the story. Um, you know, that was on full display, for example, in the Theranos case. Um, what do you see in that danger of the fake it till you make it mindset yeah. or that appearance of, you know, everything is great even when it's not? Yeah, I mean, this is something that's, you know, so deeply ingrained in the DNA of Silicon Valley, perhaps second only to do whatever it takes to be successful, is, you know, hype your company. Uh, you know, investors expect it, you know, they, everybody, there's sort of this tacit understanding that I'm not going to be pitching you on our current reality, I'm going to be pitching you on the future reality. And that's almost what investors want to hear oftentimes, too. It's like, don't trouble me with the you know, the mundane details of, of what's going on today. Tell me, you know, the grand vision of how you're going to be a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and, you know, Theranos is obviously, you know, the most crazy example where it just really gets out of control. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people in Silicon Valley, a lot of executives and founders are very char charismatic people. There can be a tendency to, you know, for their top executives to become a little you know, sycophantic and not really challenge uh, the reality distortion field as it's sometimes described. Those types of founders are by and large celebrated, right? I mean, they're the ones that get books written at, uh, about them. Um, and so young entrepreneurs sort of feel like, gosh, if, you know, Steve Jobs or whoever can, you know, completely distort the reality, you know, I should do that too. Maybe that's the key to success. Um, so I, I wrote a, 
one of one of my other blog posts was called fake it till you're fraudulent and i think that's another real responsibility that product managers have which is you know just not completely losing track of wh where is that line of reality and you know as the book portrays very frequently we in tech companies and particularly people in product management and leadership roles are are put into challenging situations where there isn't an obvious right or wrong answer, right? You know, Sam kind of wrings his hands over some of the decisions he needs to make. He's kind of trying to, you know, clean up slash cover up this fraud, but he also recognizes that if he blows the whistle on it entirely, he's going to have to lay off, you know, 200 employees. And so there's, there's not always a clean um, right answer. Um, and uh, but but you need to be reflective. You need to be, you need to really think you know think through again what what are those consequences and sort of things. So Mayron, can we do we have time for me to ask you one question too? Yep. I I would I would love to hear your thoughts. I've got System Air right here, and and uh, I should probably remember this from the book. But you know, if you were to sort of wave a magic wand in terms of the regulatory and and you know governmental oversight things that changes that might happen, you know, what would be your top one, two, three things that do you think would be most impactful? Yeah, I mean, I think there's actually some things on the short term that we'll probably see that are low hanging fruit. And, you know, the two main ones there are uh, a comprehensive federal privacy legislation. Um, I think Europe actually like Europe. already yeah. led that with, you know, the GDPR, General, GDPR Protection, yeah. General Data Protection Regulation. Um, in California, we have it now at the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, but I think what companies probably don't want is a patchwork of 50 different policies right. across every state. That's kind of a race to the bottom. Um, I do think there will be bipartisan support for a federal privacy policy. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is, you know, there's this notion sometimes, you may have heard this phrase, the United States innovates and Europe regulates, right? And it's like, well, are we going to shoot ourselves in the foot or in the head by having this regulation. And I think there's, you know, the CCPA in California actually has a really nice uh, setup where the way they framed it is that there's carve outs for small companies, small being defined by like number of customers, market cap, a couple other things. Um, but small companies actually are uh, excluded from the regulations of CCPA until they reach a particular size. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that they can innovate unfettered when they're small, but they see what the roadmap looks like in the future, because all small companies yeah. aspire to be large companies, yeah. so they can build the systems, right, to actually have the technical things in place to be able to get there. Um, so seeing that on the federal level, I think the second one is it's clear that AI is going to have a hugely disruptive impact on the labor force. Yeah. We're already starting to see that in uh, more uh, manufacturing jobs and in what sometimes gets referred to as lower skilled jobs. Um, and I think what we're actually seeing now, interestingly enough, with things like Copilot that's helping write code, we're seeing large language models that are generating text. Um, we're seeing things that we normally would think of as high skilled jobs. Right. AI making more and more uh, pushes into that area. So I think legislation that actually allows for reskilling and education um, are, are things we need to be thinking about now because it takes people time to be reskilled. Yeah. Um, and that's certainly going to be true for other industries. I think the big one that's going to take a while is the power of large platforms, right? And so you see some stuff now, to be honest, that I don't think is good legislation. Like there's folks who are like, let's break Facebook up into a bunch yeah. of different companies. Yeah. I think if you do that because of network effects, if you break Facebook up into five companies, what you'll get is 10 years from now, you'll have one Facebook and four failed companies because the mm -hmm. network effects means one will just win over time. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is you need to couple that legislation with things like mandated interoperability between platforms so you get real competition and data can be shared. That's the only way when you couple both the technical solution and the regulatory solution that you reach something that actually will work. That I think is going to take longer, but I think it's possible to get. How do you think that type? I agree with that completely, but then I throw in the the wrench in the work seems like international competition. You know, if U.S. companies are regulated in that way, you know, but you know, TikTok isn't. Uh, you know, how how do you think about the international landscape? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing we're seeing right now is the the but China question, right? If we mm -hmm. do this, but China will do this, and you can see, you know, there's 
already kind of it's framed as an arms race in AI, primarily between China and the United States. Russia is considered a distant third, mm -hmm. um, but really it's 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 China and the U.S. right now. Um, I think that the two things we need to keep in mind there is what is the kind of outcome you want to see. So China is putting huge investment into AI primarily as a surveillance technology, mostly for their own citizenry. Right? And so if you're doing that, what you're doing is you're creating innovation around technologies that we actually don't want in the United States. Mm -hmm. We don't want AI used for surveillance. We don't want to see more things like facial recognition than tied with things like social credit scores. Right? So part of it's how the technology gets deployed. I think the second thing we need to think about from the, that regulatory landscape is the notion of when we think about what is the future with the regulatory structure around technology is also a decision about what you want the future governance structure to look like. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is in the United States, if we have algorithms making a bunch of decisions about people and we don't have things like transparency or algorithmic audits or due process, essentially all that power of decision-making gets put in the hands of technologists that are building that technology. Mm -hmm. You take that and you mirror it in China, essentially the what that technology, the sponsor of that technology is the state. And so what you're getting is essentially an authoritarian view of technology as a means of control. Mm -hmm. If we don't want that in the United States, then we actually need to have regulation that puts more transparency and power in the hands of citizens. Mm -hmm. You can still do that while you have uh, innovation, but you just need to think about what is actually the outcome I wanna get to. And I don't wanna be grandiose, but I spend a bunch right. of time with political scientists now what you want your vision to be in terms of a governance structure for that technology. And I That's think democracy is a much better structure than authoritarianism. Do you think, what do you think about this notion shorthand would be uh, like clinical trials and tech, you know, the big tech companies are already testing new features, you know, could they be required to submit those test results to some regulatory body just to give that transparency into what's going on and, and, and perhaps face a public, you know, backlash or reckoning? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And actually, uh, Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft, had a proposal along those lines where he said, look, you know, people don't like bias, right? They don't want biased right. algorithms. The problem is we don't have any mechanism that forces people to measure it. So right. what we could do is have a regulation that says, look, there are some standard data sets. There are some standard metrics you need to measure. All algorithms before they can be sold or deployed have to be measured on these metrics. And those things can evolve over time. Then the marketplace can make a choice because you can see all these measures. It's kind of like nutrition labels on food, right? right? right. You get essentially nutrition labels on algorithms and the marketplace can decide what do they want once you have that transparency. Very interesting, very interesting. Um, well, let's see. I, I don't know, Mela or Tom, if you are, uh, sh should we turn it over to questions from the audience? If there are any, or, or Mehran and I could go on all night. <laughs> we, we have a lot of uh, questions to ask each other, but I want to make sure we leave time for Q&A. Why don't we open up for a few minutes and then we can get back to you if, if people don't have your questions. Yeah, there, there are a couple of good questions in the, in the comments already. I see uh, Ron responded to a handful of them. Uh, just uh, call people's attention. Uh, there was a question about advocacy groups in Silicon Valley work on uh, legislation uh, and issues related to technology. Uh, Hey, Ron, did you want to just verbally uh, uh Repeat, yeah, so there's a bunch of groups along these lines. I mean, EFF, which was also mentioned, I think, um, uh, by by Christopher. Thanks for doing that. Is is one of the older ones um, that is you know focused on issues around both now algorithmic transparency, but for a long time around uh, digital privacy and rights. Um, I, I can tell you, and and there's the uh, Trust and Safety Professionals Organization. There's the Algorithmic Justice League. There's the partnership on AI. There's lots of organizations now that are worrying about these issues, trying to do some advocacy. So if you want ways to get involved beyond your company, you know, a couple of web searches, you can find a bunch of ways to do this. One thing I will definitely say is, you know, and I do this myself as a technologist, I lament like the lack of expertise in Washington. Um, and I realized like, I can't just lament it. If I want to do something about it, I need to get involved with it, right? And that's the the kind of the onus on us as people in the tech sector. We can make a difference by actually getting involved with 
you know, providing expertise to our local congressperson, actually, you know, having advocacy, getting involved in these organizations, or there's even for folks that are interested, like there are congressional fellowships where technology folks go and do like a six month or one year tour of duty with a person in Congress to provide them information about tech policy. So if you really want to do it, there's opportunities to get involved. I, I think another thing that would be incredibly helpful industry-wide is you know, there was trustee out there for a while, but like the terms of service of different sites, you know, it's sort of, you know, as a user, as you, your highway analogy, Miron, you know, it's like, oh, you, you don't like our terms of service, you don't get to use the product, right? There's just no uh, middle ground. And, um, you know, reading an enormous uh, toss document is, infeasible. This is something I've lived in my career is, oh, let's just put that into the fine print, you know, kind of nobody will ever, everybody just clicks approve anyway. Um, you know, do you, have you see, come across any instances, and I don't know if this would be a private organization like trustee or a governmental entity, but just that would almost score um, companies terms of service and, 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 you know, so that you as a consumer could be more informed as to whether it was they were operating the business ethically or not, especially with data privacy. Yeah, I, I mean, there are some that do it. I haven't looked at them in detail, yeah. um, but there are definitely some that, that do kind of try to raise warning bells. Um, the problem is then you get into a question around, um, you know, which organizations do you trust to give you the, the skinny on the terms of service? So it's a level of indirection there. But there are folks who do it. Maybe even EFF might have done it at one point. Okay. Um, but I don't remember offhand who does it now. I, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, I still have got uh, chills from reading about Elon Musk this morning and Twitter. And it sounds more like the good old Wild West than anything that would be regulated in any way. Sounds as if it's wide open, would, could be, could be to anything that anybody wants to put on there. And I'm just wondering what your reactions are, if you have any, or if you don't, that's fine too. I'll, I'll, I'll take a first stab at that. So um, I think that will, in a weird way, potentially self-correct. Um, I actually already, um, I've been working on a blog post that I haven't quite posted yet called uh, t Twitter is a zombie. And the notion of that is basically that I think as the, 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 the whole debate over how many accounts were fake accounts to me completely missed the point of what's broken on Twitter, which is it doesn't matter how many accounts are fake, it matters how much activity is fake, right? If those 5% of fake accounts are generating 50% of the tweets and retweets and whatnot, then you've got a completely dysfunctional platform. Um, so, you know, I, I really, and, I, and I've lived this firsthand, so and I'll divulge it because anybody can go to my LinkedIn profile and see it. I was at a company called High Five, which was, you know, it's time, at the time, uh, this is back in 2008, 2009, you know, it was a top 20 website in the world. It was the number one social network in uh, a number of countries around the world, not as prominent in the U.S. Um, but the reason that Facebook won and MySpace and Bebo and High Five and a million other social networking platforms vanished is the quality of their content. You know, Facebook was able, as critical as we are of them today, Facebook was able to do something which at the time was pretty revolutionary, which was real names and real pictures on, on most of their users. And what that led to was a more civil conversation, less harassment. Um, and I think if, you know, Twitter leans even more into the misinformation you know, kind of side of things, I think users will just flee the platform because who wants to be part of that? That's my, my two cents. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree. I think, you know, part of it is, it's in, we had a long discussion about this when we were writing the book. The United States is basically an outlier with its commitment to free speech on the First Amendment. And the First Amendment allows you to say things that are blatantly false and they are yeah, protected. Exactly. And it allows you to harass people and is blatantly yeah. protected. Virtually no other country in the world has that absolutist of a commitment to free speech, right? In, in Germany, for example, you can't have Nazi information posted on social networks. 
right? And so the question is, where do you draw that line? And, and the current structure in the United States says there is no line for you to draw. Now, I think the, the issue when you get into like the Communications Decency Act is it gave the platform some leeway to be able to draw that line themselves and not face legal action. And I completely agree with Mike. I think some of the things like you see the legislation in Texas that says you can't actually have any kind of censor, quote unquote, censorship. It's a very political bill, basically, if you look at it, but you can't have any censorship of online um, sources. Basically, really is counter to the, the traditional Republican stance of free markets. What it's basically saying is you cannot have a free market of social media platforms because you can't have different platforms that choose content moderation policies and allow consumers to pick the one that's right for them. We're forcing them all to have the same content moderation policy. I think long term that just won't hold. And what we'll actually get if we get, again, this notion of interoperability is we can actually get consumer choice for people to pick a platform with a content moderation policy they like and that potentially cuts out misinformation, as long as we're not in the sort of deleterious situation where we say, you need to recreate your friend network. That's the place where we really need the, the government interaction to say, you have to mandate interoperability, then actually you can get a lot of competition. Uh, so I saw that Catherine had a good question kind of uh, along the uh, financial goal uh, asking about the uh, venture capital and the role of uh, investors in the system that that is like a rally up. Uh, any thoughts around financial aspects and how that drives things? If that can be used as a control or uh, whether that's pouring gasoline on things that you want or don't want to. Uh, Tom, it was a little hard to hear that question, but I, I see Catherine's comment about how, how do these ideas percolate through the VC community. Um, man, I, was, I, I just want to, let me just sorry. articulate Please. real qu quickly, uh, as you were, you were talking about um, the tension between what you felt with the drive towards outcomes and exits. And that's certainly the vested interest of venture capital. If you are looking at um, shifting that a little bit, moderating it, modulating it, uh, how do you see that tension between venture capital and uh, maybe a change of focus or value within Silicon Valley. That was the nature of my question. Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, it's a great question because, you know, Sand Hill Road is what decides ultimately what products get built and, and not built um, and what companies exist and don't exist. Um, I don't know that I have a great answer for that. I do think that one of the things that is you know, particularly challenging about the venture capital model is it, it, it isn't even really trying to build good, strong, healthy, profitable businesses. Um, you know, for the model to work where most companies they invest in fail, it, it needs to identify businesses that have, you know, stratospheric potential, right? That, that have the, potential for quote unquote viral growth and, and to really, um, you know, explode exponentially. Um, and, you know, not, only certain types of companies really can do that. That's why so few get invested in, but, you know, when it, when it's happening, I mean, I've seen it when it happens, it's like people just, first of all, the entire business starts moving so fast. Um, and everybody kind of loses sight of, of, you know, they're just trying to survive almost, uh, the, the hyper growth. Um, so I don't know, I, that's not a great answer, but I don't know that I have an answer to how to, you know, it's almost like, I, I guess if I were to st still what I just said, it, it's almost like there needs to be another class of investor that isn't incented the way the venture capital firms are with their LPs expectations to, to build more sort of sustainable businesses. And, you know, we've seen other countries, that's where governmental investment can fill that gap. 
um, other classes of investors as well. So, and, we, and, and we're seeing, you know, I, I do a limited amount of angel investing, you know, angel investors have filled that gap a little bit as well. I think that there are, you know, companies that don't have that explosive growth potential of a, that venture investor would be looking for, you know, can some, there are other ways to raise capital and to find uh, investors today who won't necessarily have those incentive, uh, those incentives. So, I don't know, Mehran, if you have anything. And, to yeah, just there. to back on Mike's point, I mean, we've seen it. We've in, in part of the work we do, we talked with a bunch of venture capitalists around, you know, how they what they view as their role, how they view the power structure. One thing we actually heard from a number of people, which was shocking and surprising, is most venture capitalists capitalists felt as though they had very little power in this ecosystem, and we're like, what? You have billions of dollars you're investing. How do you have very little power? And they said, well, it's all about the race to get the best deals. And really the founders have the power. And if we put any extra constraints on the founders, they'll take someone else's money for people we really want. So whether or not you believe that is true or not, but that's the justification they gave. Now, with that said, there are venture firms we've talked to, large ones like General Catalyst, I want to call out, or I think you know, we have a recent $2 billion fund, like they're a serious firm um, that is actually putting issues around ethics at the forefront of their investment thesis, which is to actually view it from the point of this creates risk. And so companies that are engaged in practices that generate more risk, either reputational risk or practical risk with respect to regulations they are avoiding or are not thinking about, um, from their investment thesis is that they will actually get larger returns by paying attention to the, these things. Now, whether or not that works out, we need to see. That's a multi-year process. There are some economists we're talking to at Stanford about potentially actually trying to measure these things down the line. But I think there are people who are making it part of their investment strategy. And from a bottom line perspective, we need time to see how that will play out. I th that's a great point. Yeah, certainly setting up separate funds that have separate you know, goals is, is a great mechanism for doing that. And you know, I think another thing that companies companies can do is have a more balanced board. You know, too often, and this is in my book, you know, you have a board that's only the venture investors and the founder, right? There's no sort of independent board member, for lack of a, a better term. And, you know, that doesn't make sense. Maybe at an early, early stage company, you don't want sort of too many cooks in the kitchen, but I think that can really matter uh, as a company gets into, you know, it's series B, series C. Um, so that's another possible way to do that. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat. Are there other? So it looks like uh, David McFeely has yeah. a question. I think um, Murali uh, was actually ahead of me if he wants to go first. Murali, you want to go? Sure. Uh, so following up on what Mela was saying, I was thinking like, I'm assuming the panel will have different opinions, but what do you think uh, should be the attitude of these public platforms, like particularly Twitter? Like what kind of content should they be forced to allow and what, how much discussion should they have? Because the first amendment only covers uh, government speech, right? Uh, and like, or speech in like public domains, but Twitter is a private company. So what do you guys think would be a good solution given what's going on? Well, maybe I'll take a shot and then and turn it over to Mike. Um, you know, I agree it is a private company, and right now it is allowed to make the decisions it wants to make. There is like legislation I mentioned in the chat, like in Texas, that actually is trying to take some of that right away from companies to be able to modify, to be able to moderate speech how they would like. I think there's, again, places that there would be wide scale agreements, at least among the general population, not necessarily among politicians, but things like information that's verifiably false can be removed from a platform. Yes. Right, right now, that's not the case, but that's pretty low hanging fruit. Yes. Things that would rise to the level potentially of libel or slander could be removed from a platform. Right. And so there are places where we can make these carve outs. Now you get into some issues around what's actually protected with respect to things like hate speech, right? Those are the places it gets more complicated. But I think if we show a willingness to be able to at least take some steps toward regulation, we begin to flex our muscles around what kinds of things actually make sense that there's very broad social agreements about those kind of regulations. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I think honestly, anyone who thinks unfettered free speech is a good thing is naive. Uh, you know, it, it is um, 
you know, nothing will make you cynical faster about the depths of human depravity than to, to allow, you know, people to say whatever they want in an anonymous profile, right? It's, it's a recipe for complete and utter disaster. Yeah. Um, and, and, and users won't tolerate it, again, to my earlier comment. I mean, it, it, when an environment becomes so um, toxic, um, people just leave, they go to other platforms, right? So I think the notion that you can have unregulated free speech is, you know, again, naive. And, you know, so then if you accept the notion that, all right, we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to have some sort of arbitration, um, legal or otherwise, about what can and cannot be said. Um, but I, I also, I really hope that the platforms themselves, you know, <coughs> excuse me, continue to Think about this stuff. I, I know how hard it is. I, I I don't envy people at Facebook. They're getting it from both sides of the political aisle um, who who feel censored and, and suppressed. Um, but you know, non moderation is not an option. Uh, it just isn't. Um, and so and that's where I do think too having the air cover almost of regulatory. Uh, intervention is is almost a relief, I think, in some cases at companies because they feel like, okay, we're not going to lose people to the more extreme, the more extreme, the more extreme version of what we do um, because everybody will be sort of subject to the same same rules. I think, you know, CDA, what is it, Mayron, CDA 230 is the one that prevents um, them, uh, you know, social platforms from being sued for libelous, slanderous content. That seems like a pretty easy one to fix, right? I mean, if if these platforms have the specter of you know potentially legal liability, um, that I think forces them to abide by reasonable standards a little more than they are now. Uh, do we have time for one more? Or I see it's eight o'clock, uh, Mela. Tom, let us know. Let's take one more. Perfect. Okay, I'll go. Oh, yeah, um, so sorry, I'm, David, we had you queued up already. <laughs> I forgot. So my uh, question is more along the lines of teaching ethics. Uh, we spend a lot of energy um, in our universities trying to teach these business ethics uh, classes. And I'm kind of wondering if that's slightly the wrong approach uh, you know, instead of trying to create this next generation of kumbaya uh, business people, instead, there's, maybe there should be some uh, emphasis on how to work in maybe an unethical environment, because sooner or later, we're going to, all of us have probably been dropped into a situation where it was like, okay, how do I deal with this? Kind of like your book. Uh, how do I deal with this? I don't feel good about it, uh, but yet I can't leave. I got to keep my job. Uh, you know, how do I manage uh, a boss who's very unethical? It seems like we should be spending as much or more time on that versus some of the other case studies of, you know, do we go this way or that way in these kind of con artificial conundrums? I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this, but Mehran, you really should answer since you're, you, you, you have the academic uh, perspective on it. But I have, I have a kid in college right now, um, I, and, you know, I just can't emphasize enough with him the value of a well-rounded foundational liberal arts education. And I think a lot of colleges too early try to track kids into, you know, whatever it might be, accounting or business or engineering or whatever, and they just don't get exposure to multi multidisciplinary thinking. Um, I, I don't feel like it, I, I kind of agree with your point of like, teaching ethics sort of feels like it's almost too late, right? You, what you really wanna teach is critical thinking and analytical thinking, and, and, and then hopefully the ethical thinking, you know, naturally follows, right? Being empathetic, being able to see a situation from multiple points of view. Um, so that's kind of, you know, my answer as a, a parent, but Miran, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, as, as an academic, actually, you know, that we talk about this in our class, we actually talk about three levels of, of ethics that you can teach. And the first is personal ethics, which are things like don't lie, cheat, or steal. 
And that's actually, honestly, the most uninteresting form to teach. And the reason why is that there is no debate about those things. Those are things that most people know. And so the question is, had Elizabeth Holmes taken a class at Stanford that said, don't lie, teach, lie, steal, or you know, mislead, would her behavior have changed? And the answer is no. She knew those things were wrong, and she still engaged with them. So the real thing is to think about how do you get beyond that? Because if there's people who want to act in a morally questionable way, that's not something that will be taught out of them. They already know that's wrong. So how do you think about the higher levels? So the second level is professional ethics. How do we think about a norm in our industry when, when people take actions that we believe are wrong, the industry actually points that out and says that's wrong. And we might say, wow, well, that never happens in technology. Yeah, but it happens in a bunch of other sectors. And so it speaks to the fact that why don't we do this in technology is actually something that is uh, a problem with our field, that we put things like making money so primal in terms of the things that we're pursuing that we are unwilling to be critical of people in our own field. Now that's beginning to change a little bit. And you can see, you know, as, as Mike referred to earlier in this also dilemma with one of the you know, characters in his book, but that feel is beginning to change that as we take a more critical view of ourselves. But the third level is really what we think of as, as political ethics, which is that, you know, and as, as Ali mentioned in the chat, like who decides about content moderation, right? And the issue there is that most things that are about ethics that are actually like non-obvious problems are value tensions. There are multiple values we care about. There's 300 million people in this country who are on a different place on that spectrum in terms of what their value is. So who gets to make the decision? Right now, the people that get to make the decision are a handful of executives that run tech companies that set those policies. And they set those policies for billions of people. If we really believe in a democratic process, what we need to do is we need to debate what the values are. And we have a technology that adjudicates among those values. It's called democracy. It's slow. It's not optimal. It's deliberative by design. But it is the best technology we have found to adjudicate among multiple value trade-offs. And so we need to bring these decisions to the fore and actually have them decided among different possibilities by a democratic process. Otherwise, it has no legitimacy. And that's what we're seeing right now with tech platforms is folks like Mark Zuckerberg make some decision and 100 million people howl because they're like, who made you king? And he says, I did because I run the company. Yep. Is that the future we want? That's really the question for us. Great point to end on. Love it. Agree 100%. Well, very, very good. This was a lively discussion. Uh, hopefully, you guys can hear me and my microphone is cleared up a little bit. Much awesome. Um, so, uh, uh, I'd like to thank both of you for taking the time. It was an interesting conversation. I think we're, uh, we're, uh, it, it was great to get a little retrospective and step back and, and look at how. Uh, things are structured and what the drivers are and you know the behaviors and uh, kind of questions of ethics which uh, frequently aren't covered necessarily in, in discussions uh, around product management but we're front and center in, in a lot of those discussions so uh, this was uh, a great conversation and an unusual one that I think should happen more frequently uh, and the valley in the industry go out and buy those books They're yeah if you're interested worth it if you're interested, we can't, we can't uh, sign them virtually, but I know. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to fix that somehow. Maybe there's another uh, another yeah. opportunity there for a, a new new technology. But uh, uh, yeah, thanks to you both. Uh, if anyone's interested in the books, they're certainly available online. Uh, I've I've just recently finished up Bitflip myself, and now I've got to go tackle the other one next. Um, and uh, stay tuned to your email, uh, and we for we will be announcing the details of the November meeting, as well as a potential in-person happy hour, uh, just to kind of decompress after work in a non-work environment. So uh, I think that is a useful thing to bring back. So uh, we'll all see you all soon. Hopefully, stay safe, stay healthy out there, and enjoy your uh, upcoming Halloween if you celebrate that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thanks Thank very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Maron.